good evening and warm wishes of the republic day to one and all it's a proud day for us when we were discussing and planning this particular meeting we thought we should do something different and something special for uh, this republic day in the, our cci webinar and then the idea struck to one of us that we should think about some of the errors which happen during the clinical decision making during interventional procedures and during surgeries and then how people struggle grapple with those emergencies those sometimes disasters which are unexpected how we come out of it and how we learn maximum out of our errors disasters unexpected complications mistakes whatever you call it so i think this is going to be one very very insightful kind of a journey and four of my friends have today joined me in sharing some of their very interesting and very difficult to manage kind of a situations so i think this is definitely for the first time in cci history that we are doing this kind of a program and i think this should become a trend uh, that we should be discussing things of this sort because success stories are everybody wants to publish them every day there is no doubt about it but uh, problems complications things going wrong things unexpectedly taking a disaster turn and how we fought it so i think uh, we are going to uh, first of all start with uh dr nasir yusuf he is one of the famous cardiothoracic or other thoracic surgeon from koshi i don't think i am going to introduce everybody in a formal way because you know all of these four people uh i think that will be followed by dr atri uh, dr atri gangopadhyay you all know has been one of the pillars of cci uh that will be followed by vijay vijay kumar chinnam chetty and vijay again needs no introduction he is the in charge of these webinars at this point in time he is the uh, organizing secretary if i am not wrong of the C upcoming cci con in hyderabad cci con 5 and uh, uh, once again i think uh, all four of them and dr sushil jain last but not the least from raipur and very very active people they have we have been seeing them throughout and i don't think uh, they any of them has done any anything less than say 10 webinars in cci over the last two years so i think with that kind of uh, background that we are all familiar faces we are with you in front of you and i think we have been telling you our success stories most of the times today is a different day and we are going to tell you about some things which were not perfect far from perfect almost a disaster and some with some luck and some enterprise by one and all and the people and that and that team how it functioned at that point in time people have uh, scraped through so that kind of a thing so we are this is uh, you know in 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 the radiology conferences this is called as a complication meet so you know there is a standard complication meet and and let me say that before i first hand uh, request dr nasir so to start this that if somebody says that i never had any complications then there are only two messages to be drawn one that he has never done any single procedure and the second he is lying either of the two is true so if you have never had a bad day then then you you never either work or you are lying either of the two so with that uh let me invite uh, dr nasir yusuf to start his case and uh, that will be followed by uh, atris and then um, so we'll finish the cases and then we'll come back to the panel discussion hello i congratulate the chess council of india for including this topic and to my knowledge this is the first time we are discussing this on this platform thank you dr nitin abhyankar for your poetic introduction and i 
commend my fellow panelists, Dr. Atri, Dr. Vijay Kumar, and Dr. Sushil Jain for coming forward and being brave to be here with us this evening. I shall take a deviation from the normal, and that is that I shall be discussing a cardiac case rather than a thoracic case, because I think there are a lot of learn lessons to be learned from this case, which can be telescoped into our daily practice. So this will be part one, and then the part two, which will be the epilogue. And let's hear what we have in the prologue. Names have been withheld, including the plays, because of confidentiality reasons, classes. A 29-year-old female presents to the outpatient clinic with breathlessness and palpitations. A quick CT scan reveals on the axial plane bilateral effusions, which obviously explains the cause of dyspnea. The coronal section shows something even more interesting. A large tumor is seen in the right atrium as well as into the mediastinum. These tumors, these cardiac tumors, can be classified into primary and secondary, and by far benign is more common than malignant, and which forms only a quarter of the tumors. Of course, that's a happy observation because it carries a poor prognosis. And the secondary to the heart can be from the breast and lungs. Our friends across in the cardiac cath lab biopsied this patient and it came as angiosarcomas, which is of course malignant. And in this particular case, it involves the myocardium in, and the right atrium. Now, the problem with malignant cardiac tumors is it continues to present a difficult therapeutic challenge and surgical resection is the only solution. Chemotherapy and other forms are of very little benefit. Because of the rarity of primary cardiac malignancies, therapeutic concepts and methods of surgical resection have not been standardized, so each is on their own. However, surgery being the only option, and that too, we have to do an open heart surgery, which is done by connecting the heart to the heart lung machine, which acts as a, as a heart as well as a lung, doing both their functions, circulation and oxygenation. This briefly shows four heads. The first one, is wherein the blood is brought in from the body, from the right atrium, into the heart lung machine, sent to the oxygenator, and then pumped out from the second head into the body. These two are for suction catheters. So here we see, this is a cannula going into the superior vena cover, another going into inferior vena cover, and that takes the blood to the heart lung machine, oxygenation is done, and the circulation is maintained by bringing it back through the aortic cannula. Here, the heart has been stopped, the right atrium is open, and the lesion C. Surgery was performed, and it was found that the primary angiosarcoma was infiltrating the atrioventricular junction and tricuspid valve. A fantastic surgery was performed, and as is the norm abroad, there was a round of applause for the surgeon. Then disaster struck. So the heart, while being taken off from the heart lung machine, would slow down and not pick up. Reason was unclear.
this caused panic, despair all around. And finally, the technician, the anesthetic technician, solved the problem. And bingo, the heart began to beat. It was good to see the heart pumping away to glory and we checked the suture line for any kind of problems and thereafter the patient we could take him off the heart rate machine. What had transpired was it was a matter of practice for other cardiac cases that the anesthesiologist along with the team once the patient is put on bypass go down for a mug of coffee. And they remain there till we tell them over the intercom that we are coming off bypass and they march in and quickly connect the patient to the ventilator. And that is a routine practice. However, this today, in this particular instance, being an exciting case, nobody left the theater, including the anesthesiologist, and everybody was glued onto the surgery. So much so. They didn't go down for the cup, mug of coffee and in the bargain, when the patient came off the heart the machine, it was an oversight. The ventilator was not connected till later on picked up by the technician. So the unsung technician turns to be the hero, the unlikely hero. Don't underestimate anyone around you. Everyone has the power to surprise anyone at any point of time. Today, we must all be aware that protocol takes precedence over procedure. Protocol takes precedence over procedure. Protocol isn't expensive, it is priceless. Every cog in the wheel is indispensable. The technician, the unlikely hero. Success, failure is all part of life. We all try to to reach that solution, what is success, what is failure. However, in this particular case, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day, while failure is simply a few errors repeated every day, breach of protocol. And those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. If only the anesthesiologist had gone down the mug of coffee, this disaster would have been avoided. We learn that please do not break protocol and learn from history and the past. And if we do not heed it, we are condemned to repeat it. Very good evening, respected ladies and gentlemen who have joined from India and abroad, wishing everyone a happy Republic Day. And I want to thank Dr. Nitin Abhyankar, sir, for this very kind introduction and giving me the opportunity to present this topic. So without much ado, I am sharing my screen. And I am going to tell you, my name is Atri Gangopadhyay. I work at Ranchi, Jharkhand. Jia dhadak dhadak jai. Sometimes when we are dealing with lung cases, something goes wrong. It may be heart of the patient, but when it goes wrong, it can definitely involve heart of the treating doctor. I definitely admit some mistakes were of colleagues. Unfortunately, some mistakes may were my own. I want everyone to learn from my mistakes for better patient care. I shall also be sharing how I learned from my mistakes for better outcome in future. 80 year gentleman, known COPD, history of ATT one year ago, right lower lobe localized bronchiectasis post ATT, suspicion of malignancy, this is the x-ray as you can see right lower lobe. There are a lot of infiltrates. 
patient was referred to me for bronchoscopy as chest symptoms despite multiple antibiotics and more important to rule out malignancy so bronchoscopy done we can see left side is normal and in the right side we can see some localized collection in the lower lobe which i removed did the toileting took a microscopic sample immediately after bronchoscopy patient is unresponsive there is labored breathing loud crackles need for oxygen this was a walk in opd cases i had told the attendants that bronchoscopy is a routine procedure you can walk home after the procedure and now i am with a 80 year old unresponsive gentleman thoughts in my mind why did i come to hospital today why is my bronchoscope not out of order today why did i not have a national cme today why did i become an intervention pulmonologist why did i become a pulmonologist why did i qualify mbbs and trans anesthetists are behind the screen anonymous heroes they saved my patient and my reputation that day head up leg down oxygen diuretic colus shifted to icu niv recovered in 4 hours after that a detailed cardiological evaluation shows a severe lv dysfunction moderate tr and pah basically patient had a gradual worsening cardiac status secondary to long standing copd that suddenly worsened after a day care procedure that was supposed to be normal so list of chronic lung diseases that can lead to such kind of heart failure copd untreated asthma post tb sequelae bronchiectasis ild depositional lung disease or pneumoconiosis and recent additions lung cancer survivors and severe covid survivors so basically if the patient says kuch kuch hota hai kindly suspect some heart disease although the patient can come to you with lung symptoms so what did i learn even if a patient is referred for intervention evaluate independently and thoroughly chronic respiratory case anticipate heart problems explain possible complications to attendants although however remote never take an intervention as an ordinary procedure because every patient is above statistics never do bronchoscopy in a campus where anesthetist is absent my anesthetist saved my hide that day and how did this help me 3 months later a 45 year female known case of situs inversus severe ms with ph referred for bronchoscopy as chest was symptomatic and no relief on conventional therapy or clue by conventional investigations i explained to the attendants regarding flash pulmonary edema and other possibilities and took a high risk concern local anesthesia to bronchoscopy lavage and coming out was less than 2 minutes the moment i came out with my scope my assistant props up the patient procedure and post op uneventful and patient walks home the same day so i want to thank you and request the continuing discussion i'm absolutely delighted to be part of this webinar thank you krishna anna and entire team for giving me this opportunity to be part of this webinar nitin boy okay thank you for that nice introductory words i right. in next few minutes okay we'll i'll share my thoughts on this topic what went wrong in one of my cases and uh, how to convert our mistakes to Uh, take home messages so when we look at the literature okay even way back okay aristotle has clearly mentioned to err is part of human experience so i don't mean that okay we can commit errors intentionally we have to uh, plan our intervention pulmonology cases other critically ill patients meticulously and execute but every day is not as day sometimes things may go wrong so it takes absolutely you know a lot of planning and execution and to some extent luck that is needed for us to have a smooth flow 
in the cases. Medical errors are the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. Yes, this is true because medical errors includes not always, you know, those errors which uh, uh, amount for life-threatening errors. There may be very minute things. Sometimes uh, when there is a prescription errors, there may be sometimes, you know, over prescription of drugs or under prescription of drugs. This all includes medical errors. So when we look at the data, almost 40 plus million errors occurs globally and annually, annual basis. And what we can do from our end as a pulmonologist. So immediately changing our direction, immediately first important thing is to recoup, regenerate from whatever the error has happened and identify the problem and then correct it if feasible. If not in this case, at least from next case onwards, we must do all the exercises that is needed to avoid a, uh, avoid doing an error. So this is very, very important. So this is not common in, okay, medical practice having errors, but again, life-threatening errors should be avoided. But when we look at the God of cricket, that's nothing but our Sachin Tendulkar, even today we call it as a little master. So when we look at his career growth, look at in March, 2011, he has done his 99th century, but when did his 100th century has come back? 100th century has come back after on 16th March 2012 against a very, very weak team that is Bangladesh team at Dhaka. So 34, he has taken 34 innings and 370 days to get this achievement. So when, when Sachin Tendulkar is struggled to get his 100th century from 99th century for 34 innings and 370 days. So what are we right in front of, you know, Sachin Tendulkar? We cannot apply same analogy in the medicine practice. But remember, my dear friends, okay, it is not easy to cakewalk, okay, in each case. We, we also experience a lot of bounces, a lot of uh, critically ill patients. Whatever you do, patient may not be surviving. All that needed is a lot of patience at the end of the day and a lot of, you know, time that you need to spend with your patient families so that to make them understand this is a really a sick patient. Yes, in 1990s, it has happened to Sri Devi's mother, okay, late Sri Devi's mother, that instead of operating on one side of the brain, doctors from New York as well, okay, they operated on the other side of the brain mistakenly. So the purpose of presenting this slide is to understand errors do occur. It is our duty to make sure the meticulous execution so that errors can be avoided at any cost. So coming to my own experience, who taught me interventional pulmonology? To be honest, okay. Um, my first guru was R. Sunil Kumar, who was the assistant professor when I was in post-graduation at Andhra Medical College, Vishakapatnam, in way back in 2005. So he taught us intervention pulmonology like thoracoscopy skills by inserting a telescope into the watermilla. So that's how we, I learned my thoracoscopy. The next, my next mentor was Dr. Sai Endamuri Buffalo. I had a um, great honor of working with him at American Oncology Institute. And he was uh, leading the thoracic surgery department. I was leading the uh, pulmonology department at American Oncology Institute almost 10 years back. Yes, other literature which has helped me is national conferences, participating in international conferences, debates and workshops, etc. 
I have worked with close to 10 thoracic surgeons and many colleagues. Okay, they have uh, created a definitely an impact, but overall the enthusiasm within us, uh, what else we can do it to stretch our boundaries beyond the limitations. This all uh, is important in intervention pulmonology, particularly almost 15 years back, there was hardly very few mentors and teachers who used to train students. The luxury of now, the current day students is not there in those days. So it was like Ekalavya like training, watching in a conference, watching in a workshop, and then learning from there and implementing in our patients. That was the style of training um, in our days. What are the various kinds of medical er errors? To be brief, serious errors where it has a potentially life-threatening um, complication has happened. Minor errors, they also cause harm, but the harm is neither permanent nor life-threatening. And what is nearness? It is an error with the potential to, to cause harm, but did not occur either due to chance or timely intervention by a different intervention. So here, I want to discuss a case where almost 10 years back, 55 year female was referred to me by a medical oncology colleague who was receiving uh, cancer chemotherapy for breast cancer. And she presented with fever, cough and breathlessness for five days. And scheduled for bronchoscopy and transbronchial lung biopsies. And two bits went on well. We have got very good tissues. Ideally, we have to take four to six bits from different segments. So the third bit bled torrentially. Immediately, orders to administer tranexamic acid and adrenaline were given by me. But what has happened? So what has happened is, okay, patient bled profusely. She was coughing out blood a lot. So immediately, uh, my intensive care team has rushed in and then intubated the patient into single lung ventilation, like they tubed into left main bronchus and then stabilized the patient and took the patient to ICU. So what went wrong here? The nurse who was helping me as an assistant, when I say administer tranexamic acid and adrenaline, she has given, okay, instead of into the bronchoscope, a diluted adrenaline, she has given IV adrenaline, uh, 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 IV adrenaline one ample, and also she also given tranexamic acid. IV adrenaline immediately raised the BP to uh, almost uh, 260 to 260 by 120, and then patient had a, as a consequence, had an ischemic stroke with left-sided hemiparesis. Thank God, we could stabilize the patient. Patient was in ICU and hospital for almost five days and discharged to home. So ultimately, vicarious liability. So whatever the scenario, whoever was the drug administered as a primary physician who was doing bronchoscopy, okay, I was very shocked, annoyed, a lot of anger, frustration was there, a lot of confusion because this kind of scenario I have never faced in my life. Yes. So, but it is a vicarious liability that I am the responsible person. Immediately, few of my colleagues, they came and then helped me to console and then they made me sad, they made me drink water. Okay, a lot of comforts. Okay, my anesthesia team, they have helped me. So, and then once I went and then saw the patient in the ICU, she was stable, she was breathing. Okay, but on ventilator. See, what went wrong? What was the error? Yes, instead the sister, uh, would have, you know, given the adrenaline into the bronchoscope uh, working channel. She has given IV. That was, you know, thing. And I did not took high-risk consent in this case. That was a mistake from my end. Okay. Probably running a mock trial in such cases would have helped me to handle the situation in a better way. And 
Over confidence was conspicuous in retrospective evaluation when I evaluated myself. It looked like for me that I was overconfident. Probably I would have counseled the uh, patient family in a better way. And there was a lot of stress. The post traumatic stress was relieved once. I have seen the patient coming to OPD with physiotherapy, she was improving. And four months down the line, she could walk down uh, into the OPD with the help of support. So, what were the correction measures that I have implemented? Immediately, I have some connections in UT Southwestern Medical Center, Dallas, and uh, I could go there. And then I did my observership in uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center, Dallas, uh, in lung transplantation, where uh, I was. Uh, I have seen uh, how to perform a uh, transbronchial lung, lung biopsies in a methodical manner as per US standards and various international standards. And I was also later on uh, trained in cryo lung biopsies at Germany, Tübingen. So, in nutshell, any small procedure can land in complication. My dear friend, please remember, even if it is a small procedure, you are scheduling any intervention. I have seen few of my colleagues Okay, who started thoracoscopy and then it, they had a major bleeding and then ultimately um, uh, it was completely unplanned and uh, sometimes they have lost, okay, few patients, okay, sporadically though it is, but they could not, you know, do another thoracoscopy again. This should not happen to any one of you. That's why even if it is a simple procedure, make sure that you explain all the complications well in advance to the patient and take all the necessary measures if needed, have a uh, anesthesia and a surgical backup so the, to tackle such bleeding kind of complications. Most medical errors can be avoided with proper planning and meticulous execution. Being humble and staying focused will take us a long way. And over to Nitin sir, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I wish a very happy Republic Day to all my friends who are here today live. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like to thank CCI for giving me this opportunity to discuss uh, uh, something which, uh, which can be really useful to all of us and what I learned from my mistakes. Uh, uh, to begin with my talk, um, as you can see, mistakes, lessons, and jugar. Jugar means something uh, an innovative thing which we we would do in a in a difficult situation when you are not doing the conventional way. You are uh, you are doing it something differently, and to find a solution for a problem which uh, otherwise you would not be able to do it in a routine situation. So. Uh, Today's case, which I'll be discussing, is a case of foreign body removal from the airways. Uh, most of the time, we think that foreign body removal is easy and we uh, we do it routinely. But there are situations when it can be really difficult and sometimes life-threatening to the patient. So we have to be very, very careful and well-prepared in every case, even if you think that's the simplest one. So here is a case which I am sharing with all of you, which we had a difficult situation uh, and we were able to sail through with our innovation and with our presence of mind. This is a case of a three-year-old boy. He was referred to us from some other hospital. The patient presented to us with a history of cough and breathlessness since one day. The patient was slightly tachypneic and was on about two, three liters of oxygen at presentation. There was a history of Sita follow custard apple seed aspiration. The kid was eating it and suddenly he coughed and he aspirated. 
he was immediately brought to hospital he was brought to hospital and from the our uh, er he was shifted to the operating room for a bronchoscopic removal oh we this is the flexible bronchoscopic view of this uh, patient the, we can see a sita pulse lying in the right main bronchus completely obstructing it now as we normally do we did a flexible bronchoscopy uh, to uh, we plan to remove the seed with the help of a flexible bronchoscope the foreign body was seen obstructing the right main bronchus it was grabbed with a dormia basket and was gradually pulling it out and suddenly the foreign body got stuck at the vocal cord and we were not able to remove it it was not coming out we were struggling at the vocal cord probably the foreign body became a little uh, it became uh, flat and uh, it was it was it was too big to come out from the vocal cord and it was stuck there the patient started getting hypoxic we pushed the foreign body back into the airways and removed the flexible bronchoscope and the anesthetist intubated the patient as he was getting hypoxic this was like so a simple case suddenly became an emergency so the patient was intubated and then is a ventilated by an anesthetist however it was very difficult to ventilate the patient at uh, this point of time so now we decided to remove the foreign body using rigid bronchoscope because now flexible bronchoscopy we were not able to remove it and uh, we were, the foreign body was getting stuck at the vocal cord so i asked my uh, technician to bring the uh, to uh, get the rigid bronchoscope ready but then there is a problem the rigid telescope was not working properly and that's something really we didn't really expect that so we were in a middle of a life threatening situation the foreign body is now at the carina causing obstruction of the central airways when we pushed the foreign body down it actually didn't went into the right main bronchus but became flat and it was lying at the carina and it was obstructing uh, significantly both the bronchi the right and the left main bronchi so we were in a very very difficult situation we were not sure how to go about it and then suddenly we did an indian jugar uh, i call it as an indian jugar because this happens only in india these thing people probably may not even think about and this was a very very challenging situation the patient was hypoxic not able to we are not able to ventilate and the rigid telescope is not working properly the image was blurred probably in the previous bronchoscopy it got damaged and my technician really didn't look at it and uh, and that's what the trouble so now what we did is uh, we made something diff we did it something differently with the presence of mind we decided to use flexible bronchoscope as a telescope for our rigid intubation we i call it as flexi rigid bronchoscope uh, that was something which differently we did it we my my technician hold uh, we was holding the flexible bronchoscope and i i inserted it through my rigid bronchoscope tube and 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 we we did a rigid bronchoscopic intubation using flexible and rigid together and that's the way we were able to intubate the patient and after intubation with with the help of uh, this uh, different way i mean to say uh, using flexible bronchoscope and rigid bronchoscope together and doing a rigid intubation and then after that we were able to remove the foreign body uh, using a dormia basket with our flexi rigid bronchoscope now this sounds very simple but believe me in the tough situation if you are if i would have not been able to do it probably i would have lost the kid on table so that's something very important that we this small things if we are having presence of mind these things can be life saving so your team need to be really geared up to to uh, uh, decide and execute the right way to salvage the life of the patient and salvage your own life so the lesson learned in this situation i learned a lot in this case both the first important thing which all of us especially the students or the younger people who are uh, started doing uh, interventions and they are very enthusiastic always be prepared with flexible and rigid bronchoscope during any removal of foreign body you have to have both of them available in your bronchoscopy room and keep it ready in case we have to change it other thing which is important is always check your instruments equipments for proper functioning before starting the procedure again this was my mistake in this case and my technician's mistake probably i would take the onus on myself because it was my responsibility that i should have checked it and then plan the procedure before you start it 
and always discuss your plan with your team before you start the procedure this is very important because you may plan it yourself but if your team team is not knowing it then you may be in trouble other important thing which i learned is always have a plan b and your team should be ready for the plan b also be prepared for the worst possible complication and last but not the least have trained assistant train them properly and retain them retaining again is a very challenging thing so that's what i would uh, i learned and i would like to give the message to my uh, friends who are listening my talk i think i stop my uh, presentation now thank you Abhijal, are we live? Yeah, I think I am live. Yeah. So I think uh, thank you, Dr. Sushil, for this wonderful case, brilliant, and your jugard worked as can I as far as I can see. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think all of us uh, do go through you know these kind of uh, situations and nightmares, and I'm sure. the child's heart rate was lesser than your heart rate when when this these things were stuck at the carina and you know things like that it was it uh, just sounds so simple now yeah, yeah, but yeah. actually at that time i was like my heart beat was like maybe 120 or 140 it was like my heart was pumping like that patient was getting hypoxic my anesthetist was not able to ventilate and i was struggling and luckily we were able to think and just execute immediately and then putting my flexible rope uh, bronchoscope as a telescope and intubating uh, with the rigid and that's the way it worked so small things matter quite a bit i believe i matter a lot when you are like doing an intervention you don't need big thing but uh, you have to have presence of mind and solve a uh, situation that would be i i would say so uh, i'll i'll go back to atri to yes. his case and that's is like you no know, atri one once again a case where you can go wrong dramatically without you realizing it and i think the biggest bear bug here is we don't do an arterial blood gas even in an 80 year old individual before a procedure immediately before a procedure and therefore often that co2 which is you know flying at 60 that pul pulmonary hypertension which is plus minus you are not going to do a 2d echo on that spot and then you know you get really caught so i think uh, one thing some one of one of you said and i think that stuck in my mind is mock drills so i think the importance of mock drills is possibly paramount uh, what do you, what what is your take on this you know should we be running these kind of things as a routine in a bronchoscopy episode particularly for the students to learn from how uh, very yeah one very important thing which i learnt in my case is often we say that age is just a number Yeah. and people may be independent of age but when things go wrong the attendant of the patient actually told me that was it necessary to do this on a 80 year gentleman the son actually asked me this oh. thing <laughs> before the procedure before the procedure when the gentleman had come into my opd the son was telling that my father looks 80 but he is very fit he does morning walk he does everything yeah but when things go wrong age comes in the question so please remember that it's very important to prevent things from going wrong it's not only totally about the punishment or the monetary compensation or the loss of reputation it's about growth of the subject also absolutely certain procedures where the risk of complication increases some legislation will come to shut down that procedure absolutely. and medical science may not proceed Excellent. so we should learn from this we should create mock drills at regular intervals let's say like one thing dr sushil said that it's important to retain the assistant it's very common that people whom we train after 3 months 6 months they will get a government job or they relocate to another city or sometimes they start their own hospital in rural area whatever so whenever we realize that there are two three new people in the ot it's time for a mock drill very important absolutely brilliantly said uh, it just reminds me of a very small story i'm not going to present that as a case really but just a story so that i'll go to the next question and this is like 
uh, one person comes to me for hemoptysis and he comes from Solapur, wants a scopy done on that day and wants to go back. And not very large amount of hemoptysis. I said, okay, we'll do a check scopy. Uh, have you had any problems before? I said, no, nothing, no problem. I uh, I have the habit of doing it with the transtracheal lignocaine and I inject that and then the patient gets, gets into a cardiac arrest because of the lignocaine anaphylaxis. Now we, we revive him, we get him out. He does, you know, he goes on invasive ventilation, gets fully revived, everything becomes all right. And then we are uh, sort of, you know, counsel him that, okay, uh, we'll do the next procedure without lignocaine or whatever it is on that day. And the, on the very previous day of his discharge, we prepare a discharge card, he gets a fatal hemoptysis and dies. So that, so that kind of thing, of course, this is not nothing to do with the procedure. Whatever happened in the procedure, we did all right. And the best part is after the procedure, the patient's relative comes to me and says, Sir, isko na do teen chizon se aisa hua hai pehle. So that, so that means my history taking was inappropriate. The consent and the counseling was inadequate. And I was in a hurry to, you know, send that Solapur guy to home as early as possible. So I pushed it as a daycare procedure because he was allergic to penicillin. He was allergic to something else also and sulfur possibly. And then he, he reacted to lignocaine. So all kind of funny things happen. So I think the next Jill, question I, is to... May make, interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. To, to you. Uh, the, can the I question. add one minute story, similar story? Please do that. Please where, do that. This question is to you only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where as a patient who came, you know, uh, hemoptysis almost two times, three times. So this was uh, stabilized with overnight bronchial artery embolization. The next day we posted for uh, lobectomy because post-tubercular hemoptysis, left upper lobe, I still remember. So uh, everything is geared out, uh, geared up, and the surgeon is uh, willing to do that on that day. The guy, he, uh, the family came and then asked for, uh, dear sir, okay, uh, uh, since it is stable now, why can't we do it? Because the day which we posted is not an auspicious day for them. Oh. So but they want to do it on a, the next day, one, one day later. You don't believe, um, sir, I'm sure you, we all have a NF experience. The guy went into uh, restroom. He was brushing his teeth. He vomited copious on the next day morning where the surgery is scheduled and then collapsed. Oh. We could do and, and nothing. nothing. Probably in retrospect, in such emergencies, probably irrespective of anything. Okay, because I feel probably had I would have not permitted them for, you know, rescheduling surgery, probably... This guy would we would have saved him. Absolutely. You, sir. Please. Absolutely. Uh, I would like to add something to this uh, thing yes, what you have been discussing. Yes, yes, now, a couple of things apart from mock drill, what we have introduced is SOPs for everything. Excellent. Right from when the patient present to you, what would be the history, what would be the test required, everything has to be by the standard operating way. Okay. Because if you don't do it, you miss a lot of times. Right from our um, uh, Tooth, which is not, uh, which is like uh, we weak, and the, we are the, if you are doing a rigid wrong and you don't don't uh, look at it, you may land up and uh, the tooth may get aspirated into airways. So everything now we have designed a SOP for everything from the nurse, from my resident doctor. They have to function in that standard way. And I believe errors are being reduced. I call it as a checklist. I think most of us must have read something called checklist, checklist manifesto, a very good book, which which uh, which is which uh, tells us that how much it is important. And gradually we have improved. The errors are becoming less, and we are more careful, and we are able to pick up the problem early. And for all the patients who are above fifty, and we usually uh, go for a echocardiography before doing a bronch. Now we have started doing that. Maybe it may sound a little. Uh, odd for everyone but then I think that's we have started doing it and we are picking up cases which were missed before okay. there are cases which are like which are not even diagnosed and uh, we were able to pick it up so my anesthetist nowadays he says if anyone above 50 you get an eco done even if it is a routine wrong because we don't know when we may have a problem and most of the time when we don't anticipate we have a problem so <laughs> <laughs> in fact that there other scenario where we uh, is VAP syndromes yeah. More the VAP, you know, the more the chance of having complications. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> I agree. I agree.
so i think you know all said and done uh, this this is a very very important message for the juniors about the checklists and in fact i'll just just quote a, nothing to do with the complications but this is something which we are haunting us for two years 1899 and uh, 88 1998 and 99 we were getting too many mottt in our bronchoscopic cultures so much so that we got a reputation that in case scope se bronchoscope se ap ap to aa hi jata hai and then we set our Uh, disinfection protocol in place, and that disinfection protocol was written to the T. Okay, how many minutes? How to rinse it? How many times it has to be done? How many saline washes have to be gone through? How much air drying? Everything was written, done, written. and and now twenty years we have not had a single mot unnecessarily growing from our so every single mot which grows is genuine mot. It is never a col- colonizer. Absolutely from the scope. and the moment our scope was about to die we started getting the mot and we detected that there is a leak in it so in fact you know that, so that kind of protocolization is very very important and written checklists which are pasted which are like you know in the book everywhere and in fact i am very proud to say that we we undergo this nabh accreditation program so our department the scope department was the only one which got good everybody else got 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 okay so i think you know that that kind that kind of a, uh, uh, you know uh, recognition comes to you after some time that we disinfect the scope very religiously and not only that we also send surveillance culture so last 20 years we have been doing surveillance cultures for every 15 days after sterilizing the scope a surveillance culture goes so i think you know these these kind of disciplines are going to save us from that disaster and uh, as uh, as happened in social's case um, that that was that that was the issue that you know you had a, um, a rigid telescope dysfunctioning and i think again that checking in advance is something which we have now written down literally we have written it down that what all things to be checked and the uh, to my surprise the worst dysfunctioning element is laryngoscope the simple laryngoscope mm-hmm. is having very poor battery life or almost not having battery on that day so i think you know when you really need it so i think if you go through the checklist you know you are not going to miss it so it is a written checklist and i think that's that's very very important uh I, dr nasir is he available because i had a few yes yes he's there he's there yes so so dr nasir uh, i think uh, your case underlines the importance of not missing the coffee breaks uh, i <laughs> that, that that was the that was the funny thing that you know uh, a, a conventional coffee break was missed and therefore the ventilator was not connected if you really ask me i did not really understand all those fantastic images that you showed i really didn't understand so so throw a little more light on you know uh, what uh, uh, the the disconnection of the ventilator and reconnection how critical it was okay thank you for having me on nithin um just before i go into it the may a word about mock drill and standard operating procedures this is uh, i'm sure present in most of the corporate hospitals essential to have it and have it pasted on the wall or as a notice on the notice board the important thing about the sops are we need to have a mock drill every one or in a fortnight at least once otherwise things can go wrong people know about it so we need to have these things usually we have it on a saturday a second saturday where we go through all this it's boring but very essential so that a reminder of these three steps is not just having it on paper is sufficient now what happens in the when you stop the heart on the heart lung machine it's an open heart surgery so you can't operate on a beating heart we need to stop the heart and open the atrium as a, i don't know whether we can get the pictures however I'll, it's very simple saying it is simple so the bad blood or the deoxygenated blood is on the right side of the heart it comes to the right atrium through the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava so all that blood is drained into the machine and there it is oxygenated and through another pump another head as we call it it's pumped back into the body through a cannula into the aorta so from the right atrium 
All the blood, deoxygenated blood goes into the heart lung machine, oxygenated, and is brought back into the body through the aorta. Circulation is maintained and oxygenation has taken place. Now, when the patient is on a heart lung machine, we need not ventilate the patient. In fact, it will do more harm. So once the patient is on the heart lung machine, the ventilator is disconnected. Otherwise, the lung will keep expanding and come in the way of the surgery. Absolutely. So, and when we are coming off, when the surgery is over, we slowly wean it, the patient, the heart off the lung pump. And at that point in time, the surgery is over, the ventilator needs to be connected. Correct. That's like an ECMO thing. Now, we are also now coming across this in an ECMO scenario. So gradually the ventilation has to come back. Sure. Of course, I mean, for, for us, it is like routine. For you, it is the anesthetists who are doing it. And they are there. So they have to actively do it. Yeah. <laughs> and this is done, you know, at least two or three times or four times a day. It's a routine thing. Yeah. And normally, the surgery, with, the actual surgery might take 45 minutes, one hour. That's they really nothing much to do. The same coronary is being done. It's boring for them. They don't, they go down for a cup of coffee. And as routine, the first thing that they do is when they come back, connect the ventilator. Correct. But in this particular case, because the exciting case, they never left the theater. Okay. So that habit was broken. Yeah. <laughs> so that there's a breach of protocol and that nearly took a life. However, so we they, had, had to, they had to write, uh, reconnect the ventilator on the uh, other guy's uh, forehead uh, in order to remember that. <laughs> Correct. And this happened repeatedly. They tried to take the patient off bypass, the heart would slow down. Until a technician says, oh my God. And he didn't know what whether to say. And he quietly fixed yeah. the tube. He didn't want to say that they made a mistake. Yeah. You know? So he found that and quietly connected. And then the heart started beating. Everyone was wondering what happened. Finally, the cat was out of the bag. Now, we were, as you had rightly mentioned, Nitin, that we have discussed mainly successes, how we got of it. And we, every one of us, Certainly, including me, I've had failures, mortality. Now, Absolutely. when that happens, the stress is tremendous. Uh, so failure, there's nobody who's not had a failure. The important thing is to cope with these failures. And how do we cope? I think, can I go on or shall I? Yeah, yeah. you start it? that and I'm going to ask that question to everybody. The coping with a disaster. You no, know, that is going to be one of the next questions that I have in my mind. Now, each one of us has a diff different emotional psyche. I'm very sensitive. I get upset. So uh, I find it very difficult to cope when we have a death. So what I found over the years is in the West, they are totally, they don't have no attachment to the patient. They say never get emotionally attached to the patient. Well, that's their look lookout. So they said they can manage with this much easier. But probably coming from Indian culture and being a diff, uh, like most of us, we get emotionally involved with the patient and that causes uh, probably certain problems. So what happens once we're emotionally involved with the patient, we take in their problems within us. And that also affects our work. Now, how do we cope? Now, when there's a death, the prior to any of these surgeries, we have a counseling session wherein the counselor is there i am there and we develop a bond and stop for about 15 to 20 minutes go through all the details of the case tell them the possible complications and in our center fortunately unfortunately most of our patients 70 percent are complicated cases referred by other surgeons or other centers where they can't do it so we have a huge stress on us so we tell them we are together you, the family, the patient, and us, we are together. And let's keep that enemy, the disease, outside. Let's all work together. Correct. And build, get their confidence. Very important to get their confidence, even in a simple case, like even a lobectomy, which we call a simple case. We need to get that confidence, get them onto our side, because anytime anything can go wrong, 90% nothing happens. But if something goes wrong, like a complication or an eventuality, you know, you have their confidence and then mostly they accept it. Now, the other thing is, even if they accept it, we are drained sure. because of our procedure or the knife, a life has been lost.
So that's very emotionally draining. And how do we cope with that? I have a few, say, mantras. Is one is sit down immediately or as soon as possible with your team. Because I'm sure there are four or five people in every team. Correct. Discuss it threadbare because there has to be a cause for something to go wrong. And once you analyze that, within a day or two, let it have its logical conclusion. Do not discuss it anymore. That's one thing. You do it threadbare. Yes, every puzzle in the uh, problem has been solved. That's a problem very solving. excellent approach. Very, very good approach. That, you know, do it once and then don't discuss it any further. You know, just document whatever you have to do it and that's it. And next right. after that is immediately as early as possible, repeat that procedure. So the fear of the procedure oh, is gone. It is gone. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's very important. We it gets withdrawn and we yeah, wait yeah. for a week, two weeks down. Immediately do it. You have you're confident because you've discussed the whole thing with your team and you found what the problem is and go in and do it as early as possible. Excellent. And even despite that, this will haunt us. I know it gives me sleepless I, I, nights. I tell you though, for those juniors who are listening, these are absolute pearls of wisdom. Nothing better than that. You know, then you know, coping with a situation. Two things, two important things that Dr. Nasir has told you. One, discuss it out immediately, sort the problem out. And second, repeat it as early as you can. Don't lose out on your confidence. In fact, this is typically happens to drivers who after an accident give up driving completely. And then, then they, they will never be able to drive at all. I mean, you take a month's break and you will never be able to drive at all because you have lost the confidence. Uh, Shall I just I want to add, add something to Dr. Uh, Nasir? Yeah. I've not finished a three, but no, please go. Let let Nasib finish because he may he has another oh, yeah. Please. Going on. Yeah. So next, please, please. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Next, what happens? All this is very practical, discussed, yet it haunts us at night. <clears throat> Get yourself distracted as early as possible. Do something what you like to do, reading books, go out for a movie, and importantly, family support. Absolutely. The family, you can, you know, they understand you or your close friends. These are things which can prop you up. Okay. And to finally conclude it, it's like you're climbing a mountain. You have a back backpack. Each trouble considered as a rock and you're putting it in your backpack. Yeah. So over your life's journey, this rocks keep on increasing. Mm. <laughs> How do you make it easier? You've seen it, discussed, take that rock and throw it out. Then that mountain becomes easier to climb. Do not carry these rocks with you. Your life and journey and the climb to the top will be much easier and would happen. Thank you for your very patient hearing. I, I, I can't imagine why Dr. Nasir is not a poet, you know, the way he puts it, <laughs> brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And it's, it's almost philosophical, almost certainly philosophical. No question. So, so Atri, you were saying something. Yeah. Uh, before I continue, I just got a message from our founder father, Dr. Krishna. This webinar, even on a Republic Day, Basant Panchami Saraswati Puja, had around 400 pre-registration and as of now there are 1050 people watching us live wow. even on republic day saraswati puja so that is something really wonderful to the team over there who organizes this webinar okay. out of the box topics none topic ever repeated okay. to carry on from where dr nasir was telling uh, i grew up at rachi which is a not a very big city it's a capital but it's a very small city everyone knows everyone now that i'm practicing at rachi very few patients are strangers. Some patients are my school teacher. Some patient, my parents, colleague or friend. Some patient, my school guys, parents or relative. Very few patients. So it's very difficult not to be uninvolved or unattached. And some cases, I know that there will be a mortality or things can go bad. So there, what approach I started is that if someone is admitted under me, I will not entertain any phone call from you during the duration the patient is admitted. You need to talk to me. We will talk inside the hospital premises with the patient in front. That lot removes that personal link. And yes, once there is a mortality, discuss it over there and finish it off. Don't ruminate it in your mind. Another very important tips I would want to give to people listening us. If you want to stay away from the negativity, Please don't accept the praises and accolade. That goes to your head. Absolutely. And then when something goes bad, that hits you even hard. Absolutely. That I was being praised for 15 days and suddenly why are people behaving badly with me? Don't mm -hmm. accept the praise. 
so that the negativity does not affect you very well said Adhra. very well said really, really very beautiful uh, uh, anna uh, are you there uh, vijayana uh, yeah bye please bye so uh, the whole idea of error minimization you yes. know because we are saying uh, on one end uh, 43 million errors happened and i am sure 400 billion decisions must have gone correct so exactly what uh, you know what atri was saying what is your take on that you know, so many things we do are right and then you know one for one mistake and it gets sort of you no know, it gets you so much so down so how do you i, I have I, i have you know see every problem should need not be you know experienced by us uh, i want to share you know couple of uh, my friends experience one i will not name from um, san jose he is a busy practitioner cardiologist something went wrong there he lost two patients back to back while ptca oh. two patients back to back and uh, uh, such a very good friend that we share all the minute things with each other so he has to stop practice there in that area in san jose uh forever and then moved back to exactly opposite territory in us came back to new york and then leading a very pleasant life and second uh second uh, thing is one of my good friend okay practice in india senior pulmonologist first case went wrong in thoracoscopy blood profusely blood profusely 15 years down the line practice he is yet to start his second case yeah. second thoracoscopy but here the words of wisdom from our entire team particularly dr nazir bai okay is very very important do it okay do the thorough dissection immediately and then close the file there itself don't carry it forever yeah. okay it, it, it see we are not here gods people will attribute when a case is being saved They, you are god you are god to us okay don't take it to mind again atri reiterated very clearly there is no need to know please tell them up front immediately i am not accepting this statement i am not god god is there okay lord balaji is sitting there he will take care of you okay allah is there uh, jesus is there they will save you but you know i am not the god i am i am the tool in the hands of the god absolutely. let me try my best absolutely let me try my best okay nothing i cannot guarantee you see even after few cases what has happened is you um, see we'll tell them everything sometimes as we are more connected with our patients when compared to us we tell them to their family if they are listening these are the possible complications if i say after a uh, transbronchial cryolung biopsy there is a massive bleeding chances 1% you may lose life and then 10 10% chances that you know you will have a significant pneumothorax and then you will be in icu for at least 5 6 days then patients patient per se may not accept but the family may, may be willing to take the trace take the entire family into your stride so that the job will be very easy to talk to them even if it if the case gets success or if eventually you may end up with you know any major disorder yeah. but which patient will land in complication only god only knows in fact vijayana i'll i'll add one more line to what you said very rightly said take the family what i do in addition is when i am doing something tricky something unusual for example thoracoscopic lung biopsy not everybody does it and we we do it we practice it so i write down the complications i write down our complication rate and i send them to his treating doctor treating physician or a general physician or whoever it is and tell him to counsel once again that the risk of this procedure is this much the benefit which will be this much and then you know if they say boss 1% to sabko lena padta hai cataract surgery mein bhi lete hain likh ke to sabse lete hain ki kuch bhi ho sakta hai so you know comparatively that this doctor is telling you what are the possible risk what are what is happened in this series of cases in a transparent way and he is not bound to do that that means he will do everything for you so i think that person also adds a little bit of a value and without any pressure because he is his family friend he has been going to that doctor for last 10 years 15 years and i always land up getting a consent in fact oh, 
five of out of my thoracoscopic lung biopsies have been lawyers. One mm-hmm. actually has died, and I am still yet to be sued. So I think you know, in our setup, things are different than the uh, that another, kind of another important by. If you permit, I'll add one more important point. Yes, please. Please send it to your colleagues. Okay, as well. Okay. Correct. Correct. See for a second opinion. Second if, opinion. They, if you find it, you know, the, this patient is probably a problematic patient, problematic family. Tell them to have n number of second opinion. Please if you are willing to get the case done by me, any time, please come back. We'll thoroughly evaluate and absolutely. then we'll do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Very saying very. that you know will definitely will be saving our skin. Second important thing, okay, it gives a lot of confidence to the family and the patient as well. Absolutely. And can Thanks I take it from there? Wonderful domestic flights. Second yeah. opinion is nothing nowadays. Any yeah. place in India, you can reach in three hours. Three hours. And so I had a patient whom yeah. I offered second opinion. They went with the papers to Delhi, big shot doctor. Luckily, one of my teachers came back and told, Sir, ne bola yehi karo. Yehi karo. <laughs> so it works out. Yeah. Can I take it up from there? Yes, yes, Dr. Yeah. Nassim. Now, uh, I just thought, you know, there's a, about these second opinions and all that, it's, what, what you said is perfectly fine that you go ahead and take a second opinion. Now, the problem is, what arises is they go to, a, I'm sorry, uh, to a person who is probably much less competent than you and yeah. take the second opinion. So important that you say, but, take but a I'm learned sure. second opinion, yeah. not a, just a mere second opinion. It has to and be equivalent, at least equivalent. equivalent to equivalent. Equivalent. I agree with you. And there should be serious or, you know, give some criteria for that. And if you want, you can suggest a few names, but give some criteria, at least 10 years, 15 years in the field. Another point I would like to say at this stage is most of the viewers in CCI are youngsters. Yes. That's where the future is. Yes. But please remember tomorrow, you will be experienced, mature. But the problem is how one might become experienced, so-called mature, the high and mighty, Nothing goes wrong with me. They have to take cognizance that anything can go wrong anytime. However experienced a senior one becomes, Absolutely. one should be should, should be not arrogant. They should be humble enough that this thing can also happen to me. When I hear of a bleeding here, yeah. it should strike me. Although I'm 30 years old, it could happen to me. Yes. So this, not only humility, this realization will help you. Yes. Avoid such errors. And, and I see a has question. That, God has that uncanny habit of you know making you feel that humbleness again and again by showing you once in a while, every mm-hmm. two years, every three years, whatever that time is, that look, boss, you think you have achieved things? No, 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 no. I, I am there. I am I am I am the decision maker, and things can go wrong in the best hands in the best time. Right, rightly said, boy. Uh, uh, Dr. Nitin, I whom I know for the last 15 years is fits that criteria. He's very humble, and that's the reason he's made, made huge strikes in his career. And there's a saying, God does not think he's a cardiac surgeon, yeah. but cardiac <laughs> surgeons think that he's God. Nizan, <laughs> 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 <Well, sorry. laughs> could you have a look at the chat box? A few questions have come up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just open that. And uh, so she'll, in the meanwhile, I mean, your <laughs> take on all this, what is going on? So she said, yeah. I think that counseling question, which yeah. has come up by from Madhav Kulkarni, Karnataka, very yeah. true. It's yeah. not only pre counseling, but during the stay of during the procedure, sometimes it gets delayed. You have to keep in touch with the your counselor, has to be in touch with the family. Any complications, for, especially for us in surgery, it's a prolonged stay about eight to seven to day, five to seven days. They need to be updated throughout those days as well as. Uh, at the time of discharge, and they should be followed up. Yeah. The counselor is expected to give them a call every, especially if it's a complicated case, to I mean, almost on a daily basis till the problems uh, are eased off. Very well brought to the notice, uh, Dr. Madhav Kulkarni. Yes. Thank yes. you. I think it's, it's, it's a I very think, point. I think, and just can I add to this? I think most of the litigations happened in these days because of poor communication. Correct. Poor communication and counseling is the, is the key for the problems today. 
people don't counsel well people don't communicate well believe me in last 20 years of practice i have never had any issue just because i have been counseling i have been communicating and build up a rapport with the family in such a way dr mahashur you i remember he used to tell me that even if you have a complication patient family should come and say thank you to you that's the day when i would say that you are really a good physician or good chest physician yeah. i remember him he used to tell them i think that's very important that how good rapport you are able to establish how well you counsel that's a part of your treatment and then you should not forget that and uh, i think that's uh, that's what i would uh, say in on my part uh, saurin banerji from west bengal has asked a question it's it's a little technical if it's a big clot causes a lobar collapse what scope to use rigid or flexible or and if the other lung is okay of course i would uh, use flexible normally uh, we use this usually happen in the icu setup and most of the patients are intubated yeah. so you can use flexible and that should be good because it's just a lobar collapse uh, so should not be a problem so uh, but then you need to understand what's the cause of the problem if there's a tumor sitting below it Then and and you are trying to remove sometimes it may re bleed so be prepared with everything we if keep are, everything if ready if you by chance have an access to a cryo probe that would be brilliant you know because it gets thawed and you know comes out in one single go but the, 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 there is a issue here because if there is something behind it and you it, then you have not, it then bleed it. like anything yeah. so what i think we are prepared for a, a bleeding and we if we have a scan we see and figure out what is the underlying cause there and the inr how is the inr of the patient because yeah. when removing the clot i have seen torrential bleeding happening Absolutely. and then if you keep a balloon blocker next to you i usually keep it like our uh, kit really, really. when well, we move really to really. icu we have a, a complete uh, set of things which are there with us all the time we have like made a protocol that these things have to be there with you whether it's a, whatever simplest of the case in the icu so that's i think makes a difference because when you remove a clot we may have a torrential bleeding it has happened couple of times look at the patient's reports if the platelet is low if your inr is deranged you may have a trouble so a lot of time we may not look at the reports and then we land up in trouble so if the platelet is normal inr is normal then only go out. otherwise if the platelet is too low better first Uh, transfuse platelet trans uh, and then if the inr is not uh, is too high you correct it and then go ahead and do a bronch because a lobar collapse will not kill the patient that's yeah. the most important thing i think you know i think that, that that's what i communicate with my patients whenever we are doing anything unusual for example a scopy in a bronch i see is an unusual scopy it's not a normal scopy in the uh, endoscopy suit so what we tell tell them is look i have to prepare for the worst and i'll hope for the best so i think that's that communication goes very well with them that look that means you know the it is brought to their notice the other thing which is very uh, i mean it's practical i don't know if it's it is practicable everywhere but i uh, avoid doing a scopy on the day when the patient first sees me because there is certain amount of mental timing which is required even for a ordinary bronchoscopy that it is a procedure that it is an intervention that you are going to take some biopsy or sample there is a chance of bleeding that there things could go wrong needs to sort of trickle into his mind because invariably if you just take a procedure from the opd directly just because he is fasting and that kind of thing what i did for that solafur guy i stopped doing it after that and i i always think in one day for him to allow think about it i don't necessarily keep on harping on all the complications but i tell them that look bleeding pneumothorax if i am doing a transbronchial epilepsy these are complications and it's a procedure things can go wrong and that you know that that uh, introspection prepares him little better than being done on the same day of course i'm sure there are places where things have to be done on the given day you don't have that kind of a luxury but certain pre counseling is and a little bit of a thinking time is possibly helpful that's yeah, that what i want to add to dr if Nitin. i can add yes see, what happens is see when, uh, we have the physical copies of data with, uh, within the hospital for probably 6 months or 1 year correct so whatever the high risk procedures that we do i, I maintain uh, the data okay the consent forms and everything okay, okay. i i have opened up a uh, high risk consent whatsapp group yeah. okay all that i'll put it entire my team will be there they will take care they will place the data in the whatsapp whatsapp can be utilized this like this as well and 
video recordings is one thing where if the complication particularly mortality comes into picture we make it mandatory uh, video recording another important point that uh, we uh, i want to highlight here is we never had a luxury of getting trained from someone else to be honest for intervention pulmonology right so if we all watch and then grew up to this level yes of course uh, uh, i'm humble to uh, and honored to share the uh, the chair with uh, nazar sir here because nazar sir is very rare species on earth okay he has trained so many pulmonologists for uh, for uh, thoracoscopies and all those things so like that so whenever there is an opportunity particularly for this younger generation make sure you get complete training thorough training with your uh, the uh, experts before you pitch into your own personal practice yes okay. you. very important yes well, and this is you made a good point no procedure is simple yeah yep. it's, uh, so Thank then you. please keep that in mind and have, once you realize that pass a message on to the patient no procedure is simple they can have complications but in 99% nothing happens so uh, they should be made aware that you're not doing a simple procedure it's not like you go in the morning go to shopping mall buy a grocery and go home for lunch this is uh, uh, as you rightly said give them they should be they should realize they should know how what the procedure and how important it is and there are risks to it and, and, and never be very casual in approach exactly. to the patient the family okay when you're talking yes i have done thousand case of uh, thoracoscopies okay this is a cake walk for me that kind of words please do not give it to him because you may do 100 cases properly the 101 case may give you a really trouble so let's not give because once um, i was doing a thoracoscopy um it was led to a torrential bleed it took almost uh, we lost almost uh, close to 500 600 ml but thank god again skillfully we could control uh, the bleeding absolutely can i come in here a question yeah. from as if i am the audience to all the admin panelists we yeah. talked about recording the procedure yeah. yes so the procedure gets recorded in any case nowadays with the videoscope so that is not a problem yeah the so what we are talking about is consent recording video consenting yeah oh, so I mean, I mean, what other wants to procedure. say is we have to probably sorry sir I, i may be pitching here okay we have to re go through the entire procedures carefully and then at what point we have handled the complication rightly or not how much time we have taken to handle it if the same scenario comes again reoccurs again how better that we can handle the scenario that's sure, what sure i understand but the point is a little different i'm making yes sir yes, i put the put it to all of you yep now you said sir you were you have recorded the procedure and then if a disaster happens when the patients ask Yeah, will you share the video or not? Yes, yes, yes. We share it, sir. In fact, all my complications, all the bleeding, whatever happens, we just record it in. Uh, hey, all our recording is available fully transparently because the moment we say we are recording it, and it is our habit to give every video recording to everybody, so it really doesn't matter. Because in any case, when somebody is bleeding, all you see is red screen, nothing else. So there is nothing else to be made out of it, apart from the timelines. Nothing else. what about you vijay your hospital policy sir, yeah hospital policy is not to share sir not to share but again uh, in the printed report okay we we give uh, all the events as it is but hospital policy is not to share but i think you know it really from the bronchoscopy point of view it really doesn't make much of a difference very frankly because bleeding is bleeding and you write there is bleeding and person died i mean how what else is he going to find it apart from a timeline nothing else yeah this is more of a medical legal question medical yeah yeah, it's yeah. Medical. i want to answer from the medical legal point of view yeah uh, our hospital has a transparency policy that whenever a patient attendant requires this kind of document they need to fill out a form the and hospital a retains a copy of the form and in the form there is a let's say indication that why do you need this that also the patient attendant had to fill 
yeah. that is recorded and then it is handed over to them so yeah. nothing verbal remember nothing verbal nothing we verbal. get it in writing from them yeah, yeah, yeah. retain a copy of that and then give it then the medico legal requirement is satisfied yeah. in fact anybody requires documents they take a no objection certificate from the consultants automatically so if i have done a procedure they will take a noc from me and that is written on that paper also patient's request and the cause is also written in that so, so to reiterate even yeah. if it's a disaster you have it recorded yeah and a mistake which might be very obvious can be passed on to the patient can be passed right? on to the patient yes can we so be we have to be careful in that i think uh, sir is very correct we have to be very mean, careful sometimes if it is a gross mistake by you or your team you may have to like you can't pass it on i think that's so, that's something very easy to say but difficult to do we can't I do think, that i think sir most of the times the recordings which are coming from within the area or a i don't think they are much of a problem if it's a third party video if somebody okay. asked for a cctv coverage of that room that yeah. should not be given obvious yeah. that, well, please know, remember there, uh, yeah this video once taken will be shown to other to some of our colleagues absolutely. expert colleagues absolutely. without naming us absolutely and that can you know sir what could happen sir my experience is that most of the times people are not able to find faults with the medical procedure or medical techniques agree. Agree. because they are standardized in most ways accepting you know things like fugati being in place not being in place but those things are in you know you are making those attempts so it is visible so i think it's not that yeah agreed uh, anything else here i think we are are almost done atri you have now otherwise i'm going to take the last concluding remarks from everybody no, just to add on to what dr nitin was telling that never do a procedure when the patient meets you the first time sometimes to make it easy for the attendant to add a humor what i tell them someone new totally comes to me and they insist i insist i need it to get it done today i jokingly tell them aaj to pehli mulakat hui hai pehle mulakat mein phone number bhi le loge kal milke kal ke this breaks the ice and makes them lighten up to the procedure and to the people etc ranchi is full of good looking girls huh <laughs> <laughs> okay so i think uh, I, let's take a round of you know concluding remarks from everybody and we'll close out on this i think first of all let me thank my entire panel for being so candid and so transparent and honest and and forthcoming with things which are not perfectly right you know because i think everybody likes to discuss success stories nobody wants to discuss their disasters so thank you for showing the guts to do this and i hope this becomes a repeated future uh, in cci as well as all the all the conferences that i hold and attend so i always feel that you know unless until we do this we don't learn so much you know in fact today i have learned so much about you four also But for that matter, that you know, I mean, Sushil's are doing a three-year-old's bronchoscopy was a news to me. I used to think he's an adult doctor only. So today, I'm done a fourteen months. Exactly. Uh, I removed four foreign bodies in one kit today. Exactly. So today so morning at four thirty a.m. in the morning, I did it. So I mean, peanuts, four pe pieces of peanuts in both the lungs together. So four pieces. I've removed. Again, about learning medicine, I have learned so many new things about you four also. So I think that 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 by itself is uh, achievement. Uh, so let's start with Sushil sir. Your concluding remarks, and then we'll go to Nasir sir. And in that sequence, I think uh, what I would uh, share with my juniors, my colleagues, is that better preparedness is the key. You have to be well prepared. How standard operating procedures in your department follow? Do repeated mock drills. Train your juniors. Train your assistants. You have to train your people and and retain good people. that matters a lot if you have a good assistant sometimes it is more important than the operator himself Absolutely. so that, that that's something very important that a trained assistant can be more valuable than operator so then we have to really see that we have good people around you a trained anesthetist a trained assistant who has been working with you for a long period of time he understands how you are you will respond to a particular situation and how you should you work so that's something important so working together with the team and staying with the team training the team standard operating procedure and counseling 
and establishing a rapport with the family of the patient that matters very important if you are counseling well communicating well and having a good rapport with the family most of the times things can be managed in a much better way so that would be my take for uh, for all of us nasir sir thank you yeah but uh, i mean i'm sure all of us share your thoughts about standard procedure uh, protocol takes precedence over procedure protocol takes precedence over procedure please do not break it excellent yes and further on same it is priceless you know following protocol is not a it's not something which is expensive it is priceless you will not regret it and another point is every team member including the technician who we talked about earlier is equally important in the cog in the wheel agreed of course, of course you know listen to them they could cure them if they could solve the problem they could troubleshoot it yeah. so protocol takes precedence over procedure every cog in the wheel is important and of course communication communication and good okay. luck to each of you and your patients absolutely wonderfully said uh, uh, three and uh, uh, three up. messages yes number 1 whenever planning from a pro for a procedure if anything goes wrong the anesthetist or the acls team is your best friend yeah. so i make it a point that even if i'm not going into the ot regularly for a procedure i go into the ot to have a cup of coffee with the anesthetist or the acls team in charge yeah. they should know me at first name basis so that if i give a call they drop what they are doing and run next to me absolutely second message again internet literacy can be a boon not always a curse so on day one i upfront ask the patient or attendant if you are internet literate i give them in writing the name of the procedure and indication ask them to read about it and come back to me in 6 hours with their queries that helps settle things better get the consent understand the complication and complication incidences right. third thing i tell people i am practicing the art of medical science so nothing is absolute my provisional diagnosis may be wrong my differential diagnosis may pop up unexpectedly and one thing i would request from this platform that in medical science there is nothing known as spotter or diagnosis from a image yeah. anything can change after a procedure after a biopsy perfect something looking like a very bad anaplastic cancer can turn into a tissue granuloma also yeah so these are three simple messages from me brilliant absolutely brilliant no wisdom from everybody and apijana <laughs> nitin bhai just to start add to uh, do, uh, dr atri yeah make sure uh, let's make sure every procedure is being monitored by uh, anesthetist if it is in icu and intensivists that is more important than calling for help in the last moment when the case is going wrong that's a, uh, that's what i i am practicing for the past more than 10 years yes second second very very uncertain uh, world i have i i agree with both nazir sir and all of you so be humble and maintain healthy relationship with everyone including the ward by technician sweeper whatever it is it's it at the end of the day okay how you are greeting each other in the hospital that is very very important so maintain healthy relationship with everyone in particular with hospital staff then every day please assume it as a very very new day a new beginning though you may have a catastrophe yesterday don't bring it again to the work and it's a it's a new beginning be spiritual spiritual always help whatever the catastrophe okay pray in closing your eyes and then praying to your dearest lord will definitely help you in bailing out such critical scenarios and last but not least two important things is do the procedure in your dreams a day in advance you have to finish the particularly if you are trying to do a 
a new surgery or new procedure tomorrow finish it in a day in advance on your bed and mock drills are the mandatory and uh, how often it's again you know if you are doing a procedure after probably 3 months 4 months later particularly at least one or two mock drills before doing this procedure is very very important and uh, i'm i'm really delighted to be part of this uh, a brilliant webinar concepts led by krishnana thank you for having me here yeah wonderful so i think everybody you know this is this is tons of wisdom for all the juniors who are getting into the interventional pulmonology it's a very exciting word it looks glamorous but mind you there are problems and the and in two two words if you have to put it shit happens <laughs> shit happens is what is the bottom line so it it will it will not happen every day it will happen when you don't expect it at all and it will and it will try to catch you unprepared so being through these protocols again and again and i think one very beautiful thing said by both of you is your staff in fact my uh, the most trusted assistant is ninth pass kind of a thing his name is daya so i kind of call myself acp pradyuman and he is my daya power so you know it's like the daya kuch to gadbad hai you know kind of a thing e wo wo iska setting thik nahi lag raha you know so he me he'll immediately fix up the um, cautery settings or you know whatever is missing so and and he, he may not be the most knowledgeable person but he is the most experienced person there and most valuable asset to be had ready at your disposal particularly when this kind of a disaster strikes you let me tell you once again that those who are telling you that there are no complications uh, over 1500 procedure they are either lying or they have not done those procedures please so never believe that and i think with that wisdom from all these four people who are i mean i think i am unimportant today because i am just moderating this whole thing but you are the most important or way for gutsy people have put their own mistakes or their own problems or complications or whatever happened in their their working uh, situation i i think it needs a lot of braveness to do that so hats off to them and i hope this becomes an ongoing uh, you know uh, webinar series over a period of time of course every time we can't discuss complications you have to discuss success stories also the, as as nasir sir said we can't just have only the stones there those stones have to be removed and some success stories have to be discussed no question about it but once in a while you have to look back and look at what went wrong why it went wrong how can we correct it and most importantly how can i prevent the next disaster so with that i take your leave thank you all once again and uh, i hand it over to vijay or whoever it is thank you very much wonderful words dr nitin thank you beautiful conclusion poetic justice yeah thank you dr nitin thank you all the panelists thank you vijay thank thank you atri thank you dr nasir nasir bhai you are really brilliant absolutely we we'll learn a lot from you and definitely dr nitin avankar sir he has been excellent in his wisdom we all learn from our seniors and our colleagues and hope that we have similar discussions in the future also absolutely, absolutely. moderation from you is absolutely amazing by first of all enter credit to you you have taken in a very very smooth manner okay nazir bhai again once again oh hats off okay to i uh, as nitin bhai mentioned there is a poet in you okay we are looking forward to listen to that poet as well <laughs> thank you atri brilliant presentation today diesel you can conclude here yeah, yeah.